policy making is now happening in almost entirely within the regulatory arena of law. Mm -hmm. So the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, Occupational Safety and Health Act, National Environmental Protection Act, National Labor Relations Act, these are all regulatory laws that make it virtually impossible for people who are concerned about workers' rights or, or the quality of the environment to actually say, we don't want these toxics, or we don't want corporations bossing workers around in this way. That's not even an allowed p kind of conversation within that arena of law. Mm -hmm. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. This Populist Dialogues Cablecast program's purpose is to advance the mission of the Alliance for Democracy to create a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy and to end corporate rule. I'm your host, David Delk. Our guest today is Paul Cienfuegos. He is an educator and organizer in the community rights movement, which has now come to Portland, but more on that a little later. Paul has been our guest before, so welcome back to the program, Paul. Pleasure to be here, David. Great, great. So just talk in general about what is the community rights movement? What, what, what is it? Well, for about 13 years, um, now in nine states, 150 communities have stepped outside of the regulatory framework of law, which is this little box that government and corporations put us in where we can't actually protect the health and welfare of our communities. 150 communities have stepped outside of that little box and have said, we have the right to govern ourselves. We have that inherent authority as we the people. And um, so communities across the nation have banned corporate fracking, corporate mining, corporate water withdrawal for bottling, uh, unsustainable energy production and transmission. Um, and I'm the lead organizer of the community rights movement in Oregon. And so pretty much it's a movement of people who are kind of sick and tired of the government not doing what we think is its job to protect the health and, w health and welfare of, of the uh -huh. citizenry, and sick and tired of, of what corporations are getting away with. Okay, all right. We have built over the past century this whole uh, structure of regulatory agencies, and we assume, um, hope, that they are regulating in our benefit, certainly in our name, uh, hopefully to our benefit, but you would say otherwise. Yeah, I, I mean the history is actually really bizarre. It turns out that in the 1880s, um, the Attorney General of the United States met privately with the uh, executive directors and the CEOs of the large railroad corporations, which were the first giant railroad company, first giant corporations in the United States. And, and sorry, when were we talking about? 1880s. What, 1880s? Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Richard Olney was the Attorney General in the 1880s, and in their private meetings, they created a design for a new kind of arena of law called regulatory law that would look like a bold federal government response to massive citizen outrage against the harms being caused by the railroad industry. But in fact, they were creating laws that were written by the industry itself to regulate itself, mm -hmm. and, that, and the laws were designed to do very little. And it was the beginning of turning we the people into single issue activists. So all of a sudden, the first regulatory agency they created, the Interstate Commerce Commission, or ICC, started to funnel or channel the, the outrage from citizens about railroad harms that were happening into a regulatory structure of law where, they had, where the government started to have control over the kind of input that the public gave. And it worked so well to control public outrage and funnel it into irrelevance that after that, the insurance industries, food industries, banking industries, et cetera, telephone and telegraph industries all demanded their own regulatory agencies. So and the so industries demanded the regulatory agencies. The people didn't demand <laughs> Correct. it. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, the a and the industries themselves wrote the laws, the regulatory laws, and then the industries themselves staffed the directorship positions for the agencies. So right from the start, we have a regulatory system which basically is a corporate playing field. It's run by corporate directors. The rules are, are written by corporate directors. And then we get to participate in the way that they ask us to participate. And if we step outside of that box, then we're judged to be irrelevant and, and we're ignored. Mm -hmm. Okay. And at the same time, if you step inside the box, you get nowhere. You don't really get anywhere right, at all. Okay. That's right, because right. you can't say, farmers can't say, we don't want a corporate uh, hog farm in our town. And the regulatory agency will say, well, really, all we're here today to discuss is manure management. 
right? We're not here to talk about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's already under state preemption laws considered a normal agricultural activity. So you can't ban it because the state already considers it normal. Mm -hmm. So you, same for clear cutting, same for all of the other harms that are legal but, but uh, that are harmful but legal. Uh -huh. Okay. So the regulatory agencies are really uh, designed to narrow the conversation and narrow the types of decisions that we the people can make. Well, we don't actually make any of these decisions. So uh, I wouldn't uh, even uh, say uh, they yes. narrow our decisions. We well, they, mar they, narrow, they narrow the, the uh, possible discussion the possible and the topics. Yeah, right. right. So policy making is now happening in almost entirely within the regulatory arena of law. Mm -hmm. So the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, Occupational Safety and Health Act, National Environmental Protection Act, National Labor Relations Act. These are all regulatory laws that make it virtually impossible for people who are concerned about workers' rights or, or the quality of the environment to actually say, we don't want these toxics, or we don't want corporations bossing workers around in this way. That's not even an allowed p kind of conversation mm -hmm. within that arena of law. Mm -hmm. C can you give us uh, some, uh, a specific example of, uh, and I'll let you choose in what arena uh, of, of how this works and, and uh, how our interests aren't served and corporate interests are. The one that I tell most frequently is the one that started this whole movement in this conservative rural hog farm, hog family farm community in Wells Township, Pennsylvania, where for a number of years these rural farmers, hog farmers, were trying to stop this factory farm of 15,000 hogs from being moved into their little township of 520 people in rural Pennsylvania. For three years they worked through the regulatory agency. These were patriotic, you know, Republican farmers who had been taught in civics class when we still had civics class yeah, yeah, in school right. that we the people, you know, are in charge, that we have all this governing authority. And so they were looking for the right agency or, or you know, department in state or county government in Pennsylvania to try to figure out where do we go as a town where virtually the entire town says, no, we don't want this factory farm in our town. And what they discover is there is nowhere to go. There is no there there. And that the only thing that the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture is will, was willing to talk about at all was the management of manure in these giant warehouses full of hogs. Mm -hmm. Right, so you get funneled down into this irrelevant conversation. You get hundreds of people at a public hearing, and they all simply want to say, this isn't acceptable to us. It needs to not be approved. Mm -hmm. And the regulators, by definition, when you regulate an industry, by definition, you allow the industry. Right, otherwise, that wouldn't be called regulate. Uh, right, right? Uh, right. And that's what the permit process is. The regulatory agencies hand out permits, which permit the activity. Mm -hmm. Right? And the activity causes a substantial amount of harm, and the permits allow a legal amount of harm. Mm -hmm. right? Rather than prohibiting harm, they regulate harm. Okay. Right? Sorry. And okay. so that's the system that we're stuck within. So if a community wants to ban a particular kind of harmful corporate activity within the structure of law that we have today in the United States, there's literally nowhere to go mm -hmm. at the local level. Okay. okay. J just to make this concrete for people watching, give us one more example of how it has harmed the environment. Sure. So, I mean, in Oregon, clear-cut logging is a huge issue, right? So uh, logging law in the state is almost entirely state law, Oregon Department of Forestry. Who runs the Oregon Department of Forestry? Logging corporation executives. Who wrote forestry law in Oregon? Logging corporation executives. Um, you know, who, you know, when you, when you go to a regulatory hearing about the latest proposed timber harvest plan, the options on the table are about how it's going to be logged, not if it's going to be logged, mm -hmm. right? So here we are again arguing about the type of logging or the speed in which it's going to be logged. And again, because clear-cut logging is by legal definition under state law in Oregon a normal forestry activity, clear-cutting, mm -hmm. You can't ban clear cutting at the local or county level because that violates state preemption laws that say that anything that's considered normal and legal in state law can't be banned locally. So once again, we're inside the box. And so activists have been, are used to playing in the box and trying to just get the best that they can. And in, our, in the community rights movement, we're stepping outside of this box mm -hmm. where we don't get to write any of the rules. 
Right. Okay. So uh, this box that people get put into that is would I be correct in saying that that's the reason why we've gotten tree sets and people getting into trees and uh, chaining them to Absolutely. trees and so forth is because they don't have any way to actually address the issues other than that, well, or at least the issues which are reported within to them. Within conventional law, they don't. Right. Uh -huh. Right. So if decades ago we had understood in the forest protection movement that we could step outside of the regulatory box, we might have had a more creative toolbox to work with. Uh -huh. But it's really only in the last decade that people on the West Coast have even been, you know, slightly aware of the community rights movement. Right. And these nine states that have passed these things are mostly in the Northeast. They're, they're starting to move west. I'll talk about some of those examples. Okay. But yeah, I mean, it, 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 until very recently, people didn't actually think that there was anything they could do beyond civil disobedience and lawsuits mm -hmm. and pleading with regulatory agencies right. because those were the rules we were told we have to operate with. It's kind of what is happening here in Portland now with the Occupy uh, Mount Tabor with the reservoir, isn't it? Yeah. The demand has been for a long time that uh, that we get a waiver from these uh, EPA regulations requiring us to cover our open reservoirs. Uh, and the government seemed to be going uh, along and, and representing us and trying to get these waivers. And the new mayor uh, has said that he's not going to uh, pursue that anymore, That's that we've right. just given up. And that people, the, original, the first reaction was for people mostly to say, wow, there's nothing else we can do. but. There's a lot that we can do. I mean, and, and it's interesting because the mayor, Senator Merkley, has been really active on this issue in trying to get the waiver for Portland. But now what he's saying is he, unless he gets a request, a specific request from the city council or the mayor, he's not going to move forward any further. And the city council and mayor have said we surrender. Uh -huh. And the, the EPA um, is only requiring that, we, that the city file a plan within the next two years. It's mm -hmm. not requiring any timeline anything. that right. it happened mm -hmm. yet. And yet the city's acting like it's under high pressure deadline right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So if you step outside of this framework where all you get to do is beg the EPA, beg the city council, beg Senator Merkley, et cetera, to do something, then the, the, the alternative, which is you know what I get so excited about in this work, which is why I'm doing community rights organizing, is that you begin to, th to realize that you could pass a local law or a county law that strips the, the EPA and the federal government of any authority to tell us how to run our own water system, for example. Mm -hmm. right? Each of these ordinances can be uniquely suited to whatever the issue is. So I'm just in early conversation with, the f with this very interesting coalition of people at Mount Tabor who, I've, who I visited this week. But you know, I mean, imagine you could write a law within this community rights framework that says um, that this, you know, and, and people could pass it next year in a, in a ballot initiative that would ban the privatization of Portland's water. It would ban the mixing of, of Bull Run, you know, this incredibly pure water that we have in Portland, mm -hmm. some of the purest water in the country. There's an intention that's already in progress to mix that water with the Willamette River and Tualatin River water and serve that water to us starting very soon. Mm -hmm. No public hearings at all, it's just going forward. You could ban that within the same ordinance. You could strip the EPA of, of its authority over us in the same ordinance. You could create a democratically elected water board, water utility, and not what we have now where you know each part of the city could potentially get to elect somebody mm -hmm. to a representative board and give them sole decision-making authority over water. You could do this all within a single community rights ordinance. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it takes a lot of work. Uh, yes, uh, right, right? Yeah. But, it, but these have passed in 150 communities oh, okay. with very few legal challenges. Okay, yeah. So talk a little bit about the history of how this movement started. Uh, you, you, you talked about Pennsylvania, but what was the organization that started working and um, moving forward? So it was a movement that started um, back in 1993 uh, um, uh, that wasn't even called a community rights movement yet. Richard Grossman, who was my primary mentor early on, founded a group called the Program on Corporations, Law, and Democracy, and they mm -hmm. trained thousands of people over a decade in weekend trainings called Rethinking the Corporation, Rethinking Democracy. 
they then, and they were looking for years for lawyers who wanted to work with them and to start imagining what the, lo what the lawmaking might look like that stripped corporations of their so-called constitutional rights, which was at that point we were referring to it as corporate personhood. And as we started to understand that there's actually a, a broader frame that, that corporate personhood is within, but there's lots of other rights that aren't about personhood. And then they got involved about 10 or 12 years ago with the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. And Richard Grossman started to work with Thomas Lindsay, who was running this public interest environmental law firm in Pennsylvania. And they were doing all regulatory environmental work pro bono for communities like Wells Township. Oh, so they were they were working in the They were a regulatory recently. environmental okay. law group. Mm -hmm. And so when they when Richard and Thomas started thinking together, they Seldif that helped Seldif Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund to move towards more rights based lawmaking and away from regulatory lawmaking. And within a handful of years they had started to help communities now 150 and counting to write actual locally enforceable you know laws in these communities mm -hmm. and um, that have banned all sorts of basic so basically the current paradigm of these laws they've gone through a lot of steps they're, they're getting more and more elegant in a way is that all of the laws now ban a particular kind of corporate activity which the state considers normal and legal but which the local community considers very harmful all of them strip corporations of their so-called constitutional rights, which is what they would use to override the will of the people normally. And all of them strip state and federal preemption rights over the town so that the state and federal government no longer have the authority to say to the local community, I'm sorry, you can't protect yourself, that's illegal. Mm -hmm. So all, within one ordinance in each town, th this is all, this, these three things all take place. So um, Seldif has now been doing this for 13 years. Um, up until recently, they were all states in the Northeast. Pennsylvania was the primary state where it all started. 100 of 150 communities are there in our movement, except uh, with uh, um, the, the one interesting, not exception, but addition is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, is the first major city in the country to do this. They passed a right to water ordinance two and a half years ago which bans uh, corporate fracking within the city. And amazingly enough, there were a couple hundred fracking leases being planned within the city limits of Pittsburgh. Wow, within so the, the, within within the, the, the limit. city limits. Wow. So the, the city council, it was one of these urgent situations where the public was asking them to do something, and the city council had just, one of the city council members at the time, a guy named Doug Shields, was following what was happening in rural Pennsylvania, and he contacted Tom Lindsay from Seldiff and said, you know, can, could we do something like that in our city? Mm -hmm. And very rapidly they had a seven to zero city council vote to protect water, and I, which then required that they ban fracking within the city of Pittsburgh. Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, and so it went from <coughs> being a rural phenomenon to being a, uh, an urban very phenomenon. Very quickly. Mm -hmm. well, that's, that's actually very encouraging. Uh, any other larger cities? Spokane is the next major city that's been working on this for a while. Um, about seven years ago, they founded EnvisionSpokane.org, which was a coalition of 24 organizations, labor, environmental, church, and neighborhood groups. They've now attempted three times to run a ballot initiative. Um, they're going to be on the ballot again this November. Two years ago, they ran it and lost by just 900 votes. Oh. So they're actually very hopeful that they'll finally win what they call a Community Bill of Rights in Spokane. Um, this November through the ballot box that will um, give neighborhoods for the first time in U.S. history the legal authority to say no to major corporate development they don't want, which for the first time in U.S. history would give working people full Bill of Rights protections while at work. First time in U.S. history would give the, the Spokane River and aquifer full rights of nature, rights to flourish, thrive, evolve, mm -hmm. and would strip corporate rights if they interfered in, in implementing one of those three Bill of Rights. So okay. that's, that's a pretty broad and, and revolutionary thing going on right. in Spokane. Yeah. I, would, I, would, I would imagine that um, this has not set well with the powers that be. Not at all. In fact, the Spokane City Council has been doing everything they can to stop this right from the start. Mm -hmm. 
um, in the last two elections, two years ago and four years ago, they've tried to run simultaneous advisory initiatives asking the public um, do you, just to make sure that you understand that the city will be bankrupted if you pass this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the voter then, gets to say, yes, I understand the city will be bankrupted, yes, but I want then, it anyway. And then the next one on the ballot is the uh, yeah, yeah, Spokane's right. ordinance. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty dirty politics. Uh -huh. And this year, because they're so freaked out that it's going to win finally, the city council, um, this first the city council tried to stop it from going on the ballot, and they failed legally. And now the mayor has teamed up with 16 corporate business associations, and they're suing. There's actually two campaigns and two ballot initiatives coming up in November in Spokane. They're trying to stop both. Mm -hmm. We'll know within the next week or two. It's unlikely they'll succeed because the Washington State Constitution is really quite amazingly good in the sense that it says right in the Constitution that the ultimate um, protected authority of the people of the state is the ballot initiative, that it's oh. even of higher protected value than the vote, mm -hmm. than, than just basically the popular vote. Mm. So within the next week or two, there will be a court decision on that, and the two campaigns are countersuing the mayor and these business associations claiming that it's a, a slap suit, strategic lawsuit against public participation. Okay. So there's a countersuit now also in play. Okay. Talk about slap suits a little bit, a little more detail, yeah. but, uh, so people can understand what that is. I think it started in the 70s or 80s, I believe, and it, what started to happen was um, environmental organizations were starting to have some success suing corporations that were causing particular harm, and I don't remember the specifics back then. Mm -hmm. But so corporations, corporate leaders started considering it a major hassle that these lawsuits were kind of interfering what mm -hmm. they wanted to do, and so. Companies started suing activist organizations simply for doing things that weren't even legal. I mean, that weren't illegal. Uh, that yeah. they knew they wouldn't win the lawsuit against the activist group, but they knew that it would tie the activist group up in knots for years, and they would stop being, you know, functional in their ac in their right. activism. Uh -huh. And so, activist groups went to the state courts in a number of states around the United States, saying, "This is a," and th 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 they named this a slap suit. They said. This is a lawsuit against simple public participation. It shouldn't even be legal that we're sued for this kind of ridiculousness. Mm -hmm. And anti-slap legislation was put into law in many states, including all three West Coast states. Oh. And so now, because of very strong anti-slap legislation, you can use that law to defend yourself from a slap lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> and judges tend to side with the activist group because there's such outrageous claims being made by the companies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really, the, it's basically they're being charged with being effective activists. Uh, right. Yeah. Is, is the yeah. entire charge? Yeah. They're meant to just tie the group up in knots. Yeah. And I, th I think one of the industries that was a pioneer in these kind of slap suits was 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 the agricultural industry. Just summarize real quickly what we've talked about in, in about two minutes, just to make a, a, a final statement about Yeah, so I'm the lead organizer um, in Oregon in the community rights movement. Um, I'd love to have contact from people all over the state who might be watching this. There are now uh, seven community rights organizations in the process of building s their own structure and their own f figuring out what kind of local ordinance they're going to pass in this state, just in the last in, year in and Oregon. a half here in Oregon. Okay. Um, Portland, Newport, uh, Eugene, Corvallis, and, Mc and uh, McMinnville are the ones that are already up and running. And folks in Jackson County and Josephine County are in the process of building something. Uh -huh. And there's 150 communities in nine states that have already passed this rights type of law. Um, Ohio and New Mexico are most recent. Um, we're going to have something on the ballot in Spokane in November. And so um, pay very close attention to the community rights movement because it is taking off around the United States, bursting out of the regulatory bubble that, we're all, that we've all been stuck in for a century. All right. Thank you very much, Paul. You're we'll, welcome. We'll see you again next week. Okay. Okay, great. Good. Our guest today has been Paul Cienfuegos. Paul is an educator and organizer in the community rights movement and resides here in Portland. Contact Paul via email at paul at 100fires.com. More information on the community rights movement is available on the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund website at www.celdf.org. 
Paul is helping organize two upcoming events here in Portland with Paul, excuse me, with Thomas Lindsay, who he mentioned earlier, the founder of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Thomas will be in Portland for speaking events on September 21st and 22nd. On the 21st, he will be at Portland State. His topic will be on sustainable foods and GMOs. His second event will be on Sunday, September 22nd at the First Unitarian Church. This second event is sponsored by the Alliance for Democracy and the topic will be Why Not Local Democracy? More detail on both events will be available soon on the Alliance for Democracy Portland website and Facebook page, but please do mark your calendars now. So that's September 21st at Portland State University and September 22nd at First Unitarian Church. Don't forget that you can watch Populist Dialogues on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash populistdialogues to view, the most, to view most of our past programs. And when you are there, click the subscribe button so that when a new program is uploaded, you will automatically receive an email notice. If you're watching on YouTube, maybe you can help us expand our viewership. Please contact your local cable access pro station and see what is required for you to sponsor a weekly broadcast of our programs. Most local stations are looking for good material and will welcome the suggestion. Populist Dialogues is a project of the Portland Alliance for Democracy. Learn more about us at afd-pdx.org and our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. We want to thank our volunteers who volunteered their time to get our program on the air. Thank you to Roger Bates, Dave King, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas. And thanks to all of you for watching. I hope you will see you again next week. Bye.